All right, now, welcome back to my podcast. I got an interesting guest with me today. Now, would you like to tell people who you are and what you do? Who am I? An existential question right out of the right? box, Sean. I love it. <laughs> I'm Paul. I'm Yeah, I'm Paul Sullivan, founder of the Company of Dads, uh, based outside of New York City. Um, for 25 years, I was a journalist most of that time at the New York Times. And uh, in February 2022, I launched a company of dads as a media company, community platform, and workplace advocate for lead dads. And a lead dad is the go-to parent, whether he works full-time, part-time, or devotes all of his time to his family. In many cases, those lead dads uh, also support their spouses in their careers. But we know that 18% of all fathers in the United States are divorced, widowed, or otherwise single, and they're very much a, a part of the company of dads. That's really interesting. And I, I never had heard the term lead dad before, but then that's what I am. You know, my wife is a successful singer. And when we were, you know, after, after our daughter was born, we had this time period where, you know, I worked in education and video production. We had this choice of, you know, one of us has to go back and she makes more money than I do as a, as an, uh, as an entertainer. And so, and I, my career allows me to be more flexible. You know, I can work from home. I can, um, have that. And especially when, when we, uh, move forward, you know, uh, having a background as an educator, I really took the lead for my daughter's early education and, and development. And, you know, it, we have different roles, my wife and myself, daddy's, daddy's safe, daddy's stable, daddy's the structure and mommy's fun. <laughs> Which is awesome, you know. We have those those, those different yeah. roles we play, but it, it was really interesting because at many times I felt very alone as a lead dad and didn't have no, know who to talk to about that. And so it's really interesting to see hear about this community you're starting. How how did this ball start rolling for you? What really got you into this and to finding this need that needed to be met? Yeah, it started as a as a personal uh, journey back in 2013. I've got three daughters who are now uh, almost six, almost eleven, and almost fourteen. And back then, I had only two, and they were four and one. And my wife, uh, who works in financial services, uh, she was going to start her own firm. That was her dream. I, I was at the New York Times. I'd written a book. As I said, uh, I was fulfilling my potential. So I said to her. Go ahead, you know, uh, have at it. You're you're great at what you do. You should you should do it now. Um, and she went to her then partner and, and tried to have this civil conversation that they would you know unwind things in a orderly manner. Uh, you know, put the client first, all that stuff. And it didn't quite go that way. You know, the next day she was she was you know locked out, cut off. Uh, attorney sent her papers, and and quite quickly. She had to go from this sort of three month runway to starting her firm immediately. And the first thing she said to me is, Well, what are we going to do with the kids? And I said, Well, I'll become the lead dad. And she said, Well, what does that mean? And I said, I, I don't really know, but it's better that I uh, say I'm the lead dad than uh, that I panic. That's not going to get us anywhere. Um, but the truth was, I was able to sort of control my schedule. Like being a columnist for the New York Times, the columns do same time every week. Everything kind of runs more or less in a very predictable way. You know, books take years to write. Uh, you know, nobody calls you up and asks you to give a keynote talk in Vegas, you know, three days later. Everything in my life could be planned out. And I loved it. But at the same time, I, you know, my kids live in a, you know, I said we're outside New York City, a commuter town in Connecticut, where most of the caregiving is done by moms or paid caregivers. It's not a role that you see a lot of men uh, embracing. So I didn't go around town saying, you know, Paul Sullivan, lead dad. I went around town saying, you know, Paul Sullivan, you know, so-and-so's dad or Paul Sullivan, New York Times columnist. But it was really during um, the COVID lockdown here in, in the U.S. where I started to think, you know, differently because I'd been working three days a week from home, two days going into the city or traveling, whatever it was. And suddenly, like so, much, so many people, you know, white collar workers, so many of us, we were home, home all the time. And I said, this is, this is really different. I, I wish there, there must be some sort of, you know, group, some sort of group of guys where I can talk to them. I'm not like this super macho guy, um, but nor would I describe myself as a stay at home dad. Uh, we call them lead dads who devote all the time to their family. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with either of those. It's just not who I was. 
And when I went uh, on on the good old Google uh, to see what there was, there was a ton of stuff for moms. Uh, everything for parents uh, was also really for moms. It wasn't for dads. Anything for fathers was really dads in some sort of distress or fulfilling, you know, a, an immediate need, like a dad who just got divorced and was trying to figure stuff out. And there wasn't anything like this. And so like any journalist, I, I started doing research. I said, I wonder how many men are out there who are lead dads or who could qualify as lead dads. And all of this data in, in the U.S. Is, is super readily available. The U.S. Census asks you all types of questions. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks all kinds of stuff. You could find it. And I was, I was surprised and shocked and, but also heartened to know that there are about 20 to 25 million men in the U.S. who are lead dads or could be lead dads. Now, there's 75 million fathers, 125 million men all, all, all total, but it's still a significant number of, of men. And after that, you know, I started thinking, okay, is this really a thing? You know, I'm doing it, but it's kind of, you know, do I know any other lead dads? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask working moms. I'm going to ask working moms who really care about their careers. I'm going to ask them, what do you think about this idea of a lead dad? Do you have a lead dad in your life? And of course, they, they all came back. This is an amazing idea. My husband is the lead dad or else I wouldn't be, you know, X, Y, Z or, oh my goodness, you know, my husband feels uh, really isolated. He's the lead dad and that allows me to do, you know, one, two, three. And of course you had some people who said, no, my husband isn't the lead dad, but I sure as hell wish he was because I'm so busy and I have to do all this other stuff. Um, and those conversations really showed me that the numbers were there, uh, but also the anecdotal evidence was there for this, this market. And so end of 21, I ended my column at the New York Times, uh, and in February 22, uh, we launched a company, Dads, to do three things, you know, media, community, and workplace advocacy. And so far, so good. We're off to the races. That's awesome. It, it, you know, and it's there, there's an interesting point of, of this transition, too, that um, – two things that you said there one was w with you starting this company and then your wife starting hers that so often people have this this vision that some type of transition is going to be smooth and sometimes things are messy but yet it is mm -hmm. um you know we have different ways to make that that make it through that transition what were some of the things that you uh what were some of the ways that you overcame any of the obstacles that you were facing as you, you started forming this company and started putting this together. And were there many obstacles well, that you the faced? Ob the obstacles for the company, there haven't really, the obstacle for the company is time. It's, it's me, a co-founder and, and four other people. So that, that's the obstacle for our growth is, is time. The obstacle though, like to being a lead dad, uh, that was a different story. You know, <clears throat> now I joke, I'm, I'm the leadiest lead dad. Uh, in America, um, you know, is, is the, the leading lead dad at the company of dads. But the obstacle before is you're not accepted. You know, you're, you're, you're not, you know, here we are, you know, most lead dads are advocates for women in, in the workplace. Like we, we want everybody to have a, a fair shake. But, but you go to a playground in the U.S. and mm. as a dad, you're not seen as a, as a parent. You're seen as, as a man. And that's, and you stand out. Um, and look, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a white guy who, who, who lives in, in, in Connecticut. So, so cry me a river for, for feeling like I'm standing out in, in my life. But it's, it's a bigger issue because in certain communities, um, these mom groups, whether they're stay-at-home moms or, or working moms, these mom groups are the keepers of all the knowledge in a community. You know, my town has about 20,000 people. If you want to figure out a dance recital, if you want to figure out a sport, if you want to figure out a, a high school or a college kid to, to babysit for you, you need to be in these communities on Facebook or on WhatsApp. But if you're not, that knowledge is not you know, for you. So, so breaking into that was difficult. What did I do? I would just impersonate my wife on her phone. You know, she, she didn't really seem to care. My wife was quite busy. So that was fine by her. But you know, what was the thing that helped me sort of myself and that was that was a sense of humor you know and, and i have I, i've always taken my work very seriously but i don't take me too seriously and there are all kinds of slights you know all the time you know and, and that this isn't just from from moms who, who leave you off and by leaving me off there by extension 
leaving my kids off of things because my wife has 43,000 unread emails on her phone. Every time I look at it, uh, it, it gives me like stress. I, I have like seven unread emails and that bothers me. So it's a complete, you know, extreme. But the, the birthday party invites, if, if I'm not on them, they're going to get buried. In it. We had this happen a, a couple of weeks ago. I showed up with my daughter, one of my daughters at a birthday party and they're like, Hey man, it's, it's been moved to next week. Didn't you get the email? And I'm like, no, I didn't get the email because you only sent it to my wife, you idiots. 2023, yeah. come on. Um, but it's not just that. It's, you know, schools. The school you put, dad could be at the top of the, the, the list of the, the people to call at the school and they still call the mom. Pediatricians, they still call the mom. You know, don't even get me started on the dentist. The dentist is the bane of my existence. Like, you know, you'll talk to one person and make the appointment, then they'll confirm it with the other. And it's crazy, stupid, ridiculous because so many of those people making the call to the wrong parent in these institutions, in schools, in doctor's offices, in dentist offices, are themselves working moms. So it's not as if the school called them, they would be able to drop everything. They would want their partner or spouse to be be called as well. So it's kind of pushing past and, and trying to change that. And, and you know, once we got over to actually starting the, the, the company of dads, um, it's all about one of the things we do is, is advocacy for this and pointing out this, we're not asking for, for huge changes. This is not, you know, giving every kid in America an iPad as if that would even be a good thing. I don't think that'd be a very good thing. This is literally normalizing a parenting role. And there are 25 million men in America who are or could be, you know, lead dads. That's a third of all fop. So <clears throat> it's uh, substantial. Um, it's interesting because uh, you, as you were, as you were talking about that, um, Today, I had my daughter's parent-teacher conference, and my wife is traveling. And, you know, we walk in the room, we sit down, and they look up and they say, where's your wife? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm, I'm here. I'm the parent that's here. And they're like, uh, yeah. will she be able to <laughs> join us later? And I was like, no, she's traveling. You know, and I, I'm, I'm an educator of 20 years. I think that I can handle hearing about my daughter's education i'm pretty sure that i can i can do pretty well with that you know and they were like are you sure she can't come I was like, yes i'm here you, you should at that point you, you should have jumped up and you should have, when they first asked that question you should have jumped up and like where is she did you lose her <laughs> she told me she was gonna be here where oh, did you lose my wife come on yeah right <laughs> that would have been awesome actually that was great that would be that would be great but uh, they were they, they, there was just, just this look of like surprise and, you know, like absolute bewilderment about like, well, we're going to have to do this differently. And, and I mean, and I'm dealing with a, a, a second culture as well. You know, it's not even the States. And so, sure. it, you know, there are even more more of those roles. But it, I, I'm curious as to when you start talking to um some of these these lead dads what are some common misconceptions or stereotypes surrounding lead dads and, and how do you and how does the company help challenge and break those <clears throat> yeah a, a big misconception is that you know they had no other option that they 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 fell into this um and of course in so many cases it's a choice um and it's a discussion that mm -hmm. These men had with their their spouses. I mean, largely wives, but but we have um, you know many you know same sex couples part of the company of dads, and it's a discussion that they had to see who had you know either greater flexibility or greater rigidity in their schedules or a, a greater desire to to do this. You know, with, with my wife and me, I just as I said before had a super predictable schedule, and she had zero predictability particularly starting her own mm -hmm. firm, like somebody could call her at six in the morning, somebody could call her at six at night, you know, as we're sitting down for dinner uh, and she didn't have a choice. She had to take it. And so I had, you know, I could choose to do this. So, so that's a big, you know, misconception that, that men just, you know, fell into this. The second is that, you know, if they had a choice, they would do something else. And I found that that's not the case either. I had, um, I had a coffee this morning with a guy, you know, who I never in a million years would have guessed was a lead dad in my town. He works in sports marketing and he has been able to, you know, change up his life. His, his wife is an attorney. He, he works in sports marketing. They have five kids. Um, and he's taken on this role of, of lead dad uh, and he loves it. 
and you know some of his his more macho buddies they don't get it they're like well when are you going to go back or don't you want to you know mm-hmm. do this again he's like no what i'm doing is what i want to do um and he finds great joy and, and he you know, one of the things we've advocated for the company dads is, is for a certain company to allow people to work a care shift and if you think about you know factory workers they always work a shift uh whatever those hours are you work a shift and a care shift is a version of that for sort of office workers and the idea being is that somebody would you know commit to working you know an hour in the morning before their kids go to school then work you know solidly while the kids are in school so in the states that would be like you know 9 a.m. to to 3 p.m. or 9 30 to 3 p.m. and then commit again to do an hour work at night so you you still get to your eight hour shift um but you're doing it in a way that allows you to 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 care for your your school age children as well and and that's been you know you know well received and i say you know a, a, a third uh a third thing that i'd say is is a sort of misconception is that somehow you know uh you're less masculine, uh, you're less masculine in becoming, uh, a lead dad. And one of the most joyful things that I've found in, in starting the company of dads is, is I've been able to unify, uh, men around the United States who are lead dads, but come from wildly different backgrounds. And I, I tell the story of this guy who's become a dear friend of mine. Uh, he was a professional football player, played in the NFL, won a Super Bowl, was part of a team that won the Super Bowl uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, sacked some guy named Tom Brady, who, uh, you know, the most famous football player in the world, you know, intercepted him as the Tom Brady ball. And he is a lead dad. He's a lead dad to his two daughters. Uh, he's divorced. He has full custody of his of his kids. And it's wonderful. One, he's my pal. Two, I don't know anything about uh, the NFL or football in general. So we have conversations about fatherhood and kids. And you know, three, his kids get along with me, but we get along with my kids. But four, he is the most masculine guy you could imagine uh, yeah. in the world because he put Tom Brady on the ground again and again and again. And yet he's wonderful and open about being a lead dad. And so that's, you know, having somebody like that as part of the company dads is really great to to challenge these these misconceptions about, you know, masculinity and, and fatherhood. That's amazing. And I think that that's um we get these 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 projections placed upon us about what a dad is supposed to be like. And you know, and I I think what I saw with my dad is my dad um he didn't he didn't play by the rules as a father like he just was whatever we needed and like you know there were days where he would you know and he worked hard and he but he would always try to do things his way and we would have these adventures that were uh, you know a, a pivotal part of my my memories of my father are you know these these wild adventures that we would go on and you know, and he would just, that was his thing. And, you know, it was challenging for him. He was not a lead dad, but I think that my point being, there's no book for fatherhood. There's no guidebook and and people are making it up as they go. You know, they are, they they have what their, their dad, you know, what their parents showed them. And yet, culturally we have this there's this idea put upon us that a dad has to look a certain way and yet it's it's much different it's one it should be much more flexible (laughs) in my opinion at least yeah and i mean I, i would be happier if more men just made it up as they went along because i think what is happening for those you know 50 million men who are not lead dads is they're trying to fit themselves into some sort of mold that has been presented in the popular culture as to what a father is. A father is a provider. A father is stern. Um, you know, we were out in LA last year with the Gina Davis Institute, which does a lot of work into sort of representation in the media. And they talked about fathers being portrayed as as stereotypes. They were angry. They were bumbling. They were absent. And, you know, hmm. sure, it's on some sort of silly sitcom. You know, everybody loves Raymond. Look at it, Raymond. He's kind of bumbling. He does it, but it has an impact on the broader culture. 
Uh, yeah. And the other part is, you know, there was a time, you know, I'm, you know, I was born in the 1970s. You know, my dad was not a lead dad. My dad was not really around in, in the 80s when I kind of remember it. And what was he doing? He was traveling around working. And then after work, he would go to the bar and he'd drink doors and talk to his buddies and he'd come home late. And, you know, shock. Uh, my parents ended up getting divorced. But um, that way he was trying to figure out, you know, fit into a role that he thought was what you should do. And of course, yeah, he's a great grandfather. And I, I don't know. I, you know, I kind of asked him the questions in real time. I don't know if he wanted to do something differently, but we need to set up, you know, different models to show the positive aspects of being uh, a lead dad. And that's what we're trying to do. And the flip side of this, look, there's, there's a selfish component to this, not, not, not the for-profit business part. Um, but the selfish component is I have three daughters um, and I want my daughters to be able to do whatever they want when they grow up. And I want to reduce the systemic structural biases that my wife certainly has faced uh, yeah. in, in her career. So that, look, and if my daughter wants to be the lead mom, fantastic. But I want that to be a choice that she was able to make and not something that was expected of her just because of her, her gender. I'm with you as well. It's interesting that my daughter is um, the, the child of a celebrity and like they, people see her here and they see, Oh, she's so tall. She's so thin. She should be a model. <laughs> she can be whatever she wants to be. If that's what she wants. Great. If she wants to be a doctor, great. If she wants to be a scientist, great. It, it, it's about empowering her. And that's what caused it has helped me as a father to really embrace being a lead dad is to look at this. How can I help shape her path by not telling her what to do, but kind of like holding space to create this, this space that she can explore things, you know, that she enjoys and, and to find her path. But I have to be conscious in my parenting process. I have to be actively engaged. Otherwise it's not possible. And you, you tell that story, and I think, like, if you were growing up in my town in Connecticut uh, and your daughter's a, the child of a celebrity and she's tall, uh, people here would say, holy cow, get her playing volleyball. She'll get a volleyball <laughs> scholarship to Harvard. Do you understand how they need more? And I'm like, what? And so, yeah, we, we are <laughs> – if we are not conscious of this, we get stuck in this rut of, like, okay, what is the box that I'm supposed to put my child in? Uh, and it's a lot, it, it's lazy, it's lazy parenting. It's, it's a lot more work to be conscious and say, okay, you know, what does my, my daughter or, or son, you know, need and want and how can I parent to be a guide? I always say like, I've already been to college. I've already been to graduate school. I'm not, I'm not going to live. I already was mediocre at, at, at sports as a kid. You know, I don't need to you know <laughs> live vicariously through you. I need to try to be the best parent I can and, and put up these guardrails, uh, you know, you don't go too far out of bounds here and there, but, but literally try to teach you to drive on that pretty wide road, except when you, you bounce against the sides. And, and that's what, you know, I, I aim to do. That's what I hope that the company of dads can do is to help the, the whole family, not just dads, not just moms, but help the whole family fulfill its full potential, you know, whatever that may be. Where, where where would you like to see a company of dads going? Where would you like to see this in 10 years and 20 years? You know, we like to be the CNN of fatherhood. So we'd like to be, you know, the go-to stop, not just for lead dads, but for all fathers who want to get information. I mean, there's a huge dearth of trusted information around simple, you know, fathering questions. We just launched this thing called the Lead Dad Library. Uh, it's, you know, small, we've got to build the, the, the archive, but it's to help guys with, you know, common questions that you would have and to have a trusted space to, to go to. And we use CNN as a model because you can tune into CNN in, in Vietnam and you, you know, it's CNN, you're going to look at the brand and you know that this is CNN, but it's very localized to the Vietnamese market. And it's very different than if you're watching CNN in New York, or if you're watching CNN in, in London, or if you're watching, you know, CNN in, you know, Cape Town, South Africa, but it's still CNN. And that's our goal because you know, we had a, a limited run podcast called the Global Dads 
council. And the whole idea was to talk to people similar to, to me, you know, other men running fatherhood organizations in different parts of the country. Now it was limited because we needed people who could speak English. So it wasn't really global, but you know, it's a better, better, you know, title than the, the guy, the dads who speak English in different parts of the world podcast. <laughs> it's long. Um, but as a guy from London, uh, a guy from Mumbai and a guy from uh, Singapore. And it really showed that while we we're all dads, while we all had, had different needs, it showed me as a founder of company dads that it had to be, the approach had to be localized because instead of this thing being the roaring success that I thought it would be, it was kind of a, you know, middling effort. And that was largely because you could ask the same question, but the responses and the cultural context of the answers to those questions were so different. Now, there's still fathers who are deeply involved, fathers who are still caring very much, fathers who are challenging uh, systemic pressures where they had to be only the breadwinner and their wives had to only be the caregiver. But we realized then that we needed to have you know more of a localized uh, approach for the company of dads. Oh, that's really awesome. Well, how about... Um... Have you witnessed any stories uh, or, or had any transformative experiences of people that were working with a, a, a company of dads? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had, you know, the positive ones are, are stories of belonging, of, of people who suddenly, you know, never called themselves a lead dad before, didn't really know what to call themselves. There's this one guy um, who's become a, a, a good pal, Franco is his first name, and he was a lead dad who is a lead dad who devotes all of his time to his family but it was really difficult his, his wife had a successful career it's difficult for him to go to these parties uh with his wife and people would say you know what do you do for a living and when he he didn't have the, the term lead dad until we really popularized it um and he struggled and so he started making up not making up sorry but they, they owned a couple of apartments um as a sort of you know an investment and but like I'm, by a couple, I mean like two, or three, you know, and uh, he started saying that, well, I, I manage my real estate, por- I, I manage my family's real estate portfolio. And that was enough for the people at the party to say, oh, okay, I understand what, what you do. But now he started saying, I'm a lead dad. And that is a conversation starter in a different way, because one, it, it, it connotes power, it connotes choice, it connotes something you know, proactive. And we have, you know, scores of stories like that. The flip side though, is that, you know, because of the stigma against men as caregivers, even though there are so many of us in the United States and so many of us, you know, globally, because of that stigma, um, you know, some men, particularly those who devote all the time to the family can struggle with, with mental health issues. Like what is my worth, you know, is my self-worth and my net worth, you know, linked, you know, am I less of a man because I'm, you know, not earning more money in my wife. And and this all comes back to sort of, you know, cultural expectations that are, are placed on us. And like, look, we're, Hey, we're, we're I'm part of a generation where we can challenge these cultural expectations. You know, my father's generation didn't have that luxury. You just had to, you had to do it. But, but, you know, the inspiring part is when I look at, you know, lead dads I'm talking to in their twenties and thirties, it wasn't something they, you know, they've been thinking about it from before they had children and they've been having mm-hmm. conversations with their spouses. And they know, as, as we say often in the community, you may be the lead dad for some portion of time. You may be the lead dad for five, six, seven years, and then maybe it it changes. Maybe, you know, careers changes or expectations changes and your wife becomes the lead mom. And that's that's fine. But this group in their 20s and 30s, they're really inspiring because they're thinking this through having these discussions, but you know, companies, at least here in the U S that are slow to change, they're not going to have a choice because these are the future of their, their workforce. And they're saying, Mm -hmm. we, we want to work differently. We want to work more intentionally and happy to come in the office, but we want to come into the office for, for a reason, not just because that's what everyone has always done or everyone always did until 2019. That's awesome. Now, now, let me ask you this. Um, for any of the lead dads out there listening to this uh, that are wanting to know, well, what should they be doing? What should some next steps be? What are, what are some things that lead dads should really be considering to kind of get started in this process of this self-identification and from, you know, this, this journey of discovery? 
I mean, I, I call it, you know, broadly, you know, educate yourself. And, and that's, you know, the company of dad serves as this resource in that educate yourself and know that not only are you not alone in this, uh, and it may seem like you're alone in whatever town or city you live in, there are, you know, tens of millions of men in the U.S. and, and many millions more around the globe who are in this role silently already. You know, I, I started at the beginning telling a story on how I'd go around my town in Connecticut and didn't really say, you know, Paul Sullivan, lead dad. It was, you know, Paul Sullivan, so-and-so's father, or Paul Sullivan, New York Times columnist. But as soon as I started the company of dads, you know, men who I would not have, who, who also were doing the same thing I was doing, uh, started coming up to me. They started emailing me. Guys that I've known for five years, 10 years, and they've come up to me and said, hey, I want to be part of this. You know, I'm a lead dad. You know, I never knew the term before. I'm a lead dad. So it's to honestly know that it's you're not alone. Uh, it doesn't make you less masculine to do this. Um, and if anything, it's going to be something that's deeply fulfilling for you, but also for your entire family. So, so just go, go to the companydads.com and start educating yourself on just how many other men have chosen this role. And to know that if you, if you choose this role, if you're able to choose this role, you, you're, you're part of a, a large uh, caring community and, and you're not alone. That's awesome. One, one last question for you as, as your role as lead dad, because it seems that you also continued your career <clears throat> in some way, shape or form. Uh, during this time of being a lead dad, how did you find work-life balance between being a you know a lead dad and and having your a business professional on the other side? Uh, you know, I got to give some credit to uh, to Apple uh, and the ability <laughs> to you know have a calendar on the iPhone that could be synced to everybody you know, in my family from, you know, my wife to my teenage daughter, when she got a phone to my dad, um, so that people would know who's doing what, when. And so it really came down to, you know, super organization. And, you know, before I left, you know, my column in, in 2021, I mean, I wrote over a million words for the New York times. I wrote 600 and they should know this over 600 columns, you know, another 150 stories on, on different things. I ran special sections. I was, you know, working full time plus and, and busy, but I was hyper organized and could, you know, organize that. Now I was working, you know, on the schedule set by the New York Times, so I didn't have I, I had to work within that those parameters. But you know, one of the things I've done, you know, since since starting the company of dads, we, we don't have any, uh, you know, ho household help. So you know, I've started to sort of, you know, walk walk the walk and talk the talk. And in addition to being hyper organized, I've, I've sort of pushed myself to work these care shifts that, you know, I, I advocate for, but it's really, I mean, I feel for people, uh, you know, one of my children has, has ADHD and, and, and she struggles with executive functioning. So it is more challenging if you can't be hyper organized, but that was really, that was really the key. Uh, and then, you know, like I said earlier in this interview, a really good sense of humor, because <laughs> like, if you <laughs> can't laugh at yourself, you're screwed. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate this. It, it's been, it's been insightful. And as a lead dad, you know, it, it's also so often in life, we don't realize that we are not alone <laughs> and people, you know, get stuck in their own heads. And you, it's not even that you don't want to ask. Sometimes you don't know who to ask. You don't know where to look for information. You don't know that, you know, there are people who can comprehend it because, and like you said, like I, for one, I experienced a ton of guilt for a long time, you know, like, Hey, I should be. And I mean, and it's not like I wasn't working my butt off. I ran our entire media company for my wife. I did all of our stuff. Plus I parented our daughter, but yet I still felt guilt about not making enough money, you know, and not bringing in more, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just like, the reality was that we were making all the money we were because of what I was doing, you know, and yet there was still that guilt. Right. And I think it was just stuff that had to cultural. Be done, yeah. yeah. Look, and, and that's it. Like had I gone in, in, you know, April of 2020, had I gone online and typed in what I was looking for and found that something like the company of dads already existed, I would still be a, a New York Times columnist. I'd still be, you know, I'd be working on my third book. Uh, it was, I loved everything about that, but 
I just saw such a gaping need. And if I couldn't, you know, find it, a guy who finds information for a living, like I track people down all over the place. That, that's part of being, a, you know, a journalist for 25 years. If I couldn't find that, then other people weren't going to either. And then I just started thinking, you know what, I've had an amazing run. Like maybe I can turn this, this need, this passion into something that, you know, will make the world just, uh, just a little bit better. And, and that's, that's the goal of the company dads, like make it, make the world a little bit better, make people feel better about themselves and, and be more, you know, inclusive, uh, as, as a society. Uh-huh.